So there was a tropical storm. In fact, on the 23rd of September in 2010, a tropical storm by the name of Matthew made landfall in Central and South America. As tropical storms go, they are usually unassuming and uh, unremarkable, and nobody paid any particular attention to just another uh, tropical storm. But this tropical storm, Matthew, proved itself to be a deadly and devastating tropical storm. Uh, it is said that over the three days that it spent in um, Central and South America, 108 individuals lost their lives. There was significant flooding and mudslides and landslides. In fact, it is said that in Mexico alone, some 300 homes were destroyed, covered by the mud that came down from the mountains. And when I came across that story, I asked myself, what then is the significance? What is the story in Storms Call Matthew? And I guess the story there is that we ought not to take for granted those things that may appear to be small and insignificant. Because sometimes the small and insignificant packs a heavy punch. I guess the lesson there is that we also ought not to take for granted those things that may be unassuming and harmless because they indeed can be deadly. Then we come to Hurricane Matthew, 2016. The storm that appears that does not want to go away. They say that it is likely to loop back into the Bahamas as a, perhaps a tropical depression. But it does not want to go away. Matthew was a rough one, huh? No doubt all of us would have had our various experiences with this storm. Not only here in the Bahamas, but also in, in Haiti and in, uh, well, Jamaica had some issues and uh, Cuba had some issues and um, it made its way to the United States. I don't know the damage because I've uh, not been able to technically connect to the internet for uh, several days. And I tell you, it is, uh, it is a experience. Uh, you know, when you're used to every day having connectivity, it is uh, education. <laughs> It is an education. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I do. But, <laughs> but I just feel lost. And I hear, man, this is sweet going on, some sweetness going on in the States. I can deviate now. Uh, but the Hasties boy, Donald Trump, getting himself in more problems, and I'm missing it all. I can't even connect to the internet on my phone. Uh, and I'm missing it all. Oh. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to PC restoring power and the cable coming back on so I could catch up on those things that I would miss. But we all here today would have recently passed through a storm called Matthew. And our experiences, no doubt, would have been varied. And we would have, uh, no doubt, uh, over the days had some adverse experiences that we do not want to have visited upon us anytime soon. I know that's my mindset. But hopefully the adversities of this storm would have brought, would have taught us some valuable lessons. It would have been for naught for this storm to come and we would not have learned anything. Even if it's just that we ought to take the warnings seriously. And it appears at this time many did. As there was 
uh, the shelters for the most part were filled. Hopefully the lessons that we will have learned would have helped us in the future when we are similarly exposed to storms like Matthew. It is indeed appropriate for us today to take our lesson from the book of Matthew. <laughs> Additionally, it is proper given to prevailing circumstances for us to look at an account of a storm in the book of Matthew. And I want to speak to us today on the topic, Matthew's storm, the lessons for us. So we want to see today what we can glean from the storm that is in this book of Matthew. And to this end, I invite you to turn with me, for those of you who can see in the dark or in dim light, to Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse number 22. And speaking here of Jesus, the inspired writer states in verse number 22, he says, And straightway he constrained the disciples to enter into the boat and to go before him unto the other side till he should send the multitude away. And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when even was come, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the midst of the sea distressed by the waves, and for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came unto them walking upon the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee upon the waters. And he said, Come. And Peter went down from the boat and walked upon the waters to come to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and took hold of him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they had gone up into the boat, the wind ceased. And they that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land unto Gennesaret. If there is one thing that we as a people can be assured of on this side of eternity, and that is that we will, fend, that we will face winds that will come against us. And in the version that I read into your hearing, it referred, into, it referred to the winds as contrary winds. There is not one person here today that will be exempted from passing through the storms that will come to us during our stay on this earth. Just as the residents of New Providence and just as the residents of the various family islands and the countries that were impacted by the storm Matthew were required to face that storm. So it is with us when the storms of life comes. Nobody in this land was exempted from the storm. I don't know about you, Greg, but you got some rough fellas in your area. The storm may have been afraid to go and be in town. But I don't think so. 
Nobody was exempted. All of us had to face the storm. Absolutely no residents on the islands and on the countries that were impacted were exempted. All of us had to face what the storm dished out to us. And similarly, the same is true when it is about the life that we live in in this world. But what makes the difference when we face the storms of nature is the preparation for the storm is our readiness level. Isn't that the case? And the same things are true as it relates to the storms that we will face in our lives. If we prepare for the storm, if we are ready for the storms when they come, it will assist us in successfully getting through the storms that nature, that this world and nature sends to us. In this life, we will face storms. We must establish ourselves. If we are to prepare ourselves, when we prepare for the physical storms, for the, sorry, the storms that nature sends to us, we, we batten up our homes, we fortify our homes, we stock them up with the necessary goods, perishable goods. Non-perishable goods, sorry. You don't want perishable. The non-perishable goods. There's some things that we do to ensure that we are successful at the end of the day when the storm passes by. And for the storms that will come in our lives, we must also button up ourselves. We must also stockpile those non-perishable things. I want to suggest to you that we need to establish ourselves in the Lord. We have to form up our relationship with our God in anticipation that the storms will come. I want to also suggest to you that for us to withstand the storms that come to us in this life, that we must place our hope and our trust solely in our God. You know, sometimes when we experience storms, some strange things happen. I don't know whether it appears that houses could talk. I don't know what you all want. I've been hearing some, I was hearing some funny sounds. There's some strange noise that were coming from outside. And when you hear these things, I mean, that happened to any of you? You all hear these things, so it's just me. <laughs> you all don't hear these strange things? Wow, okay. <laughs> and sometimes the sounds that we hear on the outside, it wants us to venture on the outside to see what's going on. But Common sense tells us that we ought not to do that. That we ought to exercise some common sense and some patience. And not go outside in the elements. Because outside is where the danger is. So when the storm comes, they tell us that we ought not to go outside the ark of the safety of our homes. So when we hear the sounds, when we hear those sounds that are calling us to come and check out the suffering, we ignore them because we know that outside is dangerous. If you have not already experienced some troubles and some challenges or even some adversity or even loss or dealing with grief, or hardship, or whatever ship there may be. I want to tell you today that if you keep on living, those things will come. But when they do come, and when they, they drag us into the pits of depression, and they break our spirits, and they put us in despair, and they make us feel that there is perhaps no God or God is not on our side, we ought to resist those thoughts. 
We ought to know that God is indeed our help and our strength. And know that as long as we hold on to our God, God will not fail us. Know that the Lord is with you. And the Lord will strengthen you and the Lord will keep you during the passage of the storms that come into your lives. And I know that when we endure the storm, we feel that it is an eternity, but it will end one day. Even Matthew had to get tired and to go. He may return, but yes, but he will then go again. There are many different types of storms that we will face as we pass through this life. And for you, the storm that you may face may be different from the storm that I face. But nonetheless, we all will face some challenges. We all face difficulties as we go through this life. There is not one person in this audience today that will not be challenged by some event or something in this life. So the question for us today is, what does the Bible have to say to us as children, as child of children of God about the passage of storms in our lives? And in Matthew chapter 22, the text that we started to look at, I, I like this text because I just find that it is a very rich text with a lot of messages for us. And we began by reading in verse number 22 when we saw that straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent away the multitudes. There is a strange English word that is used there, constrained. And simply put, it means to force or to compel. It appears that Jesus' disciples may not want wanted to have leave his side. But Jesus had to forcefully ask him to leave, to depart, to go. Because they were obedient disciples, they indeed hearkened to the voice of their master. And they entered into the ship and they began the journey to the other side as Jesus had asked them to. And he sent them away to the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In verse number 23, we see that Jesus went up to the mountain and Jesus went up to the mountains to pray after he would have gotten rid of the multitudes that would have been following him. Now we are not told what Jesus was praying about here, but no doubt Jesus knew what his disciples would have to endure. And because of the kind of Savior and kind of Lord and Master he is, no doubt he was praying that God would strengthen them during their testing. We don't know for sure, but just in his character, we know that he no doubt would have had some concerns. But at the time that they entered into the ship, there was no evidence that there was a storm brewing. Not from the text, we don't see any evidence that they perceived that there was a storm coming. There's no mention of it. And no doubt many of them would have been experienced seamen. And if they would have perceived that there would have been some unfortunate event that would take, that would come upon them as they made their way across, perhaps they would have said, Master, it is not good for us to leave at this time. But in simple obedience, they hearkened to the voice of Jesus and they went into the boat and they made their journey across. And we are told that a storm broke upon the sea. And in verse number 24, we are told now that they are in the middle of the sea. They are at a, a point 
that it is not, it is good if you're trying to make it to the next side. But the distance that they had to travel to get back to where they come from, came from is like the exact same difference that distance that they had to travel to get where they wanted to go. But they were tossed by the waves. And the text tells us, for the wind was contrary. Contrary simply means against. The winds were against them. The winds opposed them. The winds were standing in their way. And sometimes when we, uh, we face these opposing winds, Sometimes when obstacles come in our way, we may begin to think as perhaps others have conditioned us to think that perhaps God is perhaps punishing us for something. Maybe, I don't know. But I want to say to you in the context here that because these disciples were facing contrary winds or winds were opposing them, that was not any evidence that God was not with them and that God was not working in their lives. On the contrary, God was indeed with them. For it was Christ himself that put them in that position. In this life, winds that oppose us will come. Just as they came to Jesus' disciples on that day, they will come to us even in this day. I want to suggest to you that it was in the will of God that these disciples face these contrary winds. It was in the will of God that these disciples face this opposition, these opposing winds. It was in the will of God that these disciples go through this storm. If that's the case, then you may ask, then is it God's will that I go through some storms? I will simply say to you, it may well be. And you may be minded to ask me, then what then is the purpose of the storm? What is the purpose of it all? But I think the text here tells us the purpose. It's important, first of all, for us to understand and to recognize that God does not do anything without a purpose. God is a God of order according to the scriptures. God is a God of purpose. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28 that with the people of God or for the people of God that, that there are some things that God has some things in place for us. And he says, for all things work together for good. For those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. All things, notwithstanding the present situation, present circumstances may appear that, that the, things are, the things are working against us. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, sorry, to the Romans told them that all things work together for good. To those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Yes, it was God's purpose. It was God's will that they go through this storm. It was Jesus who asked them to enter into the boat and to push off and to go to the next side. Jesus is the exact representation of his father. God knows all things. Jesus knew that the storm was going to come and trouble the boat. He knew that the storm would come and create fear in the lives of his disciples. But nonetheless, he asked them to 
enter the boat and to go on to the next side. It was, God, it was Jesus' will that these disciples come face to face with some contrary winds. So when we find ourselves face to face with the storms that come in our lives, we ought not to throw up our hands and, and to give up in despair. And we ought not to quit. We ought not to say that God has forsaken me or ask where is God in all of this. Do not say that I cannot see God in the storm because God is there with you. One thing that we ought to know again that God is a God of purpose and God is a God that is for his people. In Psalms 37 and verse number 23. If you doubt it, you ought to memorize it. You're told that the steps of a good man, he didn't say a wicked man or a bad man, the steps of a good man or a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighted in his way. And as I read this, Job came to, Job came to mind. Job was a good man whose steps were ordered by the Lord. And God was indeed delighted with the life that Job lived. He was proud of his servant Job. And verse number 24 says, Though he fall, he did not say a good man will not fall. He says, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast out. He may fall, but he will not be destroyed by the fall. And the reason he would not be destroyed for the Lord upholded him with his hand. And he continued on and says, For I was young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. So just hold on. When the storm comes, understand once you are a good man, once your steps are ordered by God, once God, God takes the light in your way, have this confidence that though you may fall or though you may get low, you will not be utterly cast down. God indeed will not hold you with his hand. I want you to understand that there is nothing concerning God's people that he is not aware of. There's nothing that happens in your life that God is not aware of. He knows all things, the good and the bad. He knows what you are going through. He feels your pain. He, he knows the concerns perhaps that you have. You ought not to feel that you are alone when you face these storms. You know, most people don't like the face. The storms came coming by nature by themselves. You notice that? Most people like to huddle together, have somebody along with them. Is that the case? God knows. We are never alone. God is concerned about you. When you look at the life of, of God's servant Daniel, when you look at the, the lives of his of Daniel's three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you look at them and you examine their lives, you ought to be encouraged to press on even in the midst of the most aware of storms that come to you. You see, these were three young men, all were around about 18 scholars tell us. These were individuals who were removed, forcibly removed from their homes and from their lands. They were taken into a, a pagan country, ancient Babylon. They were stripped off all that they had, all that they possessed. Not only were they taken from their homes and separated from their families, they were exposed to a pagan culture. And no doubt when you were exposed to a culture that was as strong as this, 
It would have impacted you, it would have changed you and turned you into a different person. But they did not allow that to happen. They sought to strip them down of every single thing that they had. They took away their names. Daniel, whose name meant God is my judge. His name was changed to Belshazzar. A pagan name, which means Baal's or Bell's favor. It's a Babylonian pagan god. They took away his good name, his righteous name, and they gave him a pagan name. They tried to break who he was. But Daniel will not have any of it. And there was Hananiah, whose name was God is gracious. And they changed his name and they called him uh, Shadrach, meaning the command of the moon god, a pagan name. Now y'all have to change these, uh, excuse these pronunciations, y'all know these names and me don't go to places. Mishael, whose name meant God, who is like God. Man, that's a beautiful name. They have a name that means who is like God. And they took that name and they, they changed it to Meshach, which meant who is like the moon God. And then they take this one here, <laughs> Ezrael, whatever it is. You all know his pagan name, Abednego, which means servant of an ego. These men, who had names that identify them to their God. Abednego's name before, his, his name was a uh, meant uh, God, uh, God keeps him. All these men had good, proper, godly names. But their names were taken from them because they wanted to strip them who they were and they wanted to make them into who they wanted them to be. And they tried to enforce their, their diets on them. But these men refused to eat even the foods that were presented to them. And they were thinking that if these men did not eat, they're going to wither away and they're going to dry up. And they ain't going to be good servants, but based on the diet that they knew that God ordained and God authorized, they found themselves being even looking more healthier than those who ate all the rich foods. These men were humiliated. They were made eunuchs. They were castrated. They were castrated so they had no urges. Their manhood, everything was taken away from these men. You would think that having been stripped of everything, that these men would turn their backs on their God. These men were made to endure what can only be described as a category five life hurricane. And I don't think there's any higher category than a five. These men were made to endure this. And I shudder to think what a fire would have done to us. But when it comes to the storms of this life, these men endured a category five. And in the midst of the storms of their lives, in the, the storms that came into their lives, when given an opportunity to bow down to a pagan statue and to worship the king, and no doubt if they did this, they would have gained the favor of the king. And they understood that if they were to refuse to do this, that it would mean automatic death to them. But in the midst of the storm, they decided that they were not going to bend. And the Bible says that they set their hopes on the Most High God. It's in essence, that's what it tells us. They place their hope, they place their trust in their God. And with one voice they spoke in Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 17. And they said to the king, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. 
and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, respect, respectful now. Respect. Show him respect. O king. We read that again. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I guess the question is, would it, if somebody may ask, what did God do for these guys lately? These guys were kidnapped. These guys' name were taken from them, their heritage. They were placed in a pagan civilization. They were influenced, were supposed to be influenced by these people. Everything that they knew were taken from them, but they could not take their heart and their love for their God. And they essentially said, we will honor and we will glorify our God. You have taken everything from us, but you will not take the love of our God out of our hearts. And they could have concluded in saying, and no doubt they would have said, we don't know, we don't understand why these storms are raging in our lives. And why is God allowing the storm now to intensify? It appears that this hurricane, this five, category five storm is doubling back on these guys. And no doubt they, as they stood there, they said, I don't understand. They could have said, I don't understand. Why is all this pressure being made to bear on us? But we love our God. We will not submit. We will not yield ourselves. And we will not bend. Instead, we will honor and, give, and glorify our God. When storms come in our lives, we ought to exalt our God in our lives. Just as these men exalted their God to the highest possible position in their lives. And as a result of their stand, God allowed them to enter into the fiery furnace. I want you to see, God allowed them to go into the storm. But he did not allow the storm to consume them. God did not take them out of the storm. And I know we probably would have prayed and they probably was praying, God, you know, uh, you know, I got to go to the fire, but you know, don't let the fire be too hot. I know you can do what you have to do, but this brother made this, I don't know how you make fire hotter. <laughs> I guess scientifically you can. It's possible. I know the engineer is shaking his head, say, yes, it is. But this guy, he knew how to do it. He knew how to do it. <laughs> this guy probably was a welder. He knew how to make fire hot. And notwithstanding, you would think that as they walked towards the fiery furnace, they would say, okay, all right, we just go out, God, God will do something. As they got closer and they see the people are carrying them, dropping down dead, you would think that they could say, God must he can do something. How did they get in the fire? If the fellows who were carrying them, they're dead. <laughs> So that's occurred to me. How did they get there? Is it, could it be that they use some long poles and push them, or did these guys just voluntarily walk in the fire? I don't know. But they were in the fire. Let's go back to our story, though. Know? How do we get all the way over here? <laughs> we need to wrap this up. I don't know what. You know, this account that we are looking at in Matthew, there's a lot of encouragement in here for us. And I want us again to go, uh, this, go back to this text and let me read this account in Matthew. And if you look at this account, this story with these men, Jesus' disciples on the, on this, on the sea, 
And if you read it in, in, uh, uh, the, in other gospels, you would see that some of them would, you would get the picture that these, that the, that the wind was working against, although they were rowing all they can. They were toiling and rowing. But the waves and the wind were so great that they were not making any progress. And there's a lesson for us in this. Because I know sometimes we send to say, look here man, I'm trying so hard. God knows I'm trying, but the more I try, the less progress I'm seeming to make. And I know these men as they rowed that boat trying to get to the safest shore. I don't know if it's going back was safe or going ahead was safe. But they were trying as much as they can to get to safety. But they were not making any progress. And sometimes when we work hard and we think that we are toiling and we should be making some progress and we see no progress, we perhaps conclude that that's evidence that God is not with us. But just as it was not evidence in the lives of these disciples, it was not evidence that God was against them. I want to suggest to you that it is not necessarily evidence that God is against you. God is watching over his servants, just as he watched over them. But God, Jesus wanted these men to endure this storm, to go through this storm. He wanted them to face these opposing winds. And sometimes he places us in difficulties and challenging situations. Because he wants us to work our way through these circumstances and these situations. Only one thing that these men needed to do. Jesus placed them in the boat. He told them to go in the boat and to go to the next side. Their only obligation, notwithstanding the winds and the waves and the sea, was to continue to head in the direction that Jesus told them to go. That's the same thing with us. Most of us here today have submitted ourselves to the gospel of Christ. We are Christians. God has placed us in a particular, in a particular direction. He has placed us in the direction, if we continue to go, that will lead us towards eternity. Our obligation, notwithstanding the winds and the waves that oppose us, is to hold the course and to continue to fight to get to that destination that God has pointed us to. Do not allow the devil to change your directions. Remember I said to you earlier, sometimes when the storm comes, you hear some things on the outside that tempts you to want to go outside to see what's happening. And sometimes the devil uh, puts some people in your life that tempting you to want to come outside of the ark of the church to find out what's happening. But stay in the boat. Stay in the direction that God has placed you. Don't look back. Don't be ungrateful like the children of Israel that we have been talking about over the last several weeks. These are perhaps the most ungrateful individuals I've ever come across. Although probably there are some people here today who give them some good competition. When they were in the wilderness, they said it was better than in Egypt. In fact, they refer to Egypt as the land of milk and honey. Numbers 11 and verse number 5, you may remember when we covered in our Bible study, they said, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeches and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. God gave them all that they needed to eat. Manna was the perfect food, but they wanted more. Because they were big eye. They, were, they got tired of the things that God had provided them with. And they began to look back. And by looking back, they demonstrated us that they had a short memory and they forgot. They forgot that in Egypt they were slaves. They forgot the scars that were on their backs and the backs of their neighbors. They forgot the, the cruel taskmasters that were over them. They forgot that they had to work in the burning hot sun. 
And they were beating down and they were required to make the bricks. And then they were required to stack those bricks to build the cities for Pharaoh. They had short memories. Do not let the devil tell you. It was better, it was far better when you were back in the world. And I know sometimes we hear individuals even here in this fellowship say that. That when I was in the world, I didn't have to go through all of this. When I was in the world, things seemed to break a little better for me. That's the devil talking to you. Shut your ass to those stupidness. Don't let the devil tell you that it was far better than the world, in the world and now that you're a Christian. The devil is a liar and he's telling you some lies. He tell you that those in the world are not catching as much hell as you catch it. You know that ain't true. It may appear that those in the world may be benefiting, I mean, that they may be getting ahead and doing, getting a little further off on you. But there's one thing you got the day ain't got. You got salvation. You got eternal life locked down. All they got locked down is hell and the fiery furnace. Boy, it's so hot now, boy, I sure him will go there. And perhaps y'all need to stay a little longer so y'all can go on, go to hell either. <laughs> I'm finishing now. Remember this. That those people in the world, they ain't saved. They're lost. And they're bound for help. You don't need to look at them and admire them. You need to feel sorry for them. Because they are lost, eternally lost, unless they repent and turn to God and obey the gospel. Also, it's important for us to remember that, that those who are in this world who are not checking for God, God ain't checking for them. And if they, unless they turn to God, hell is their destination. Yes, they may appear to be well off now, but a time is coming where they will have to give an account before God. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And how in this life, Lazarus faced many contrary winds. And the rich man appeared to have everything that this life had to offer. Remember at their death, how we are told in Abraham's bosom, Abraham told the man, says, Son, remember in your lifetime, you had it all. But in life, Lazarus' lifetime, he faced the contrary winds. So there are some things that we have forward to look forward to. Don't mind those who want to set up heaven on this earth. That is not going to last. Your heaven, is in, your heaven is an eternal home, the home of God. Christians, I want to encourage you, when you face your storms, do not look back. Do not look back. Do not desire to go back into the world. Those things in this world are temporary. The things of God are eternal. Yes. There's some things that we have to give up on. There's some things and some lifestyles, some changes that we are required to make. That's what kingdom living is all about. It is God's will for your life that you press on in the face of the storm. Do not go back. Challenges will come. Hardships will come. But God is indeed good. Those are my words of encouragement for you today. If you are subject to an invitation, if you need prayers, if you have been looking back, if you've been contemplating, if your relationship is not where it ought to be with God, if you're going through some storms in your life and you need the strength of God, I encourage you to come and ask for the prayers of this congregation to recommit and rededicate your life to your God. Don't think it's strange that you are going through some difficulties or hardships. God is still on the throne. God is indeed still good. I would invite you to stand as our dear brother Vince come before us and lead us.